Good afternoon and a very, very warm welcome to this first lecture in our uh, digital lecture series, Ancient Attire, in which we explore dress, clothing, adornment and vestimentary codes in the ancient world. Our lecture today is presented by Dr. Rosalind Jansen, and she's going to talk to us about unpacking Tutankhamun's wardrobe. Rosalind is Honorary Lecturer in Education at University College London Institute of Education. She also teaches Egyptology at Oxford University and at the City Lit in London. Uh, previously, she was a, cu a curator in University College London's Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. And then she was a lecturer in Egyptology at UCL's Institute of Archaeology. Rosalind has worked on excavation in Egypt as a textile expert, including in the Valley of the Kings. And she's also the author of the book, Egyptian Textiles, um, which was published first in 1985 and then um, republished in a second edition in 2005. And together with her husband, Jack, uh, Shaq Jansen, uh, she is the author of Growing Up and Getting Old in Ancient Egypt, which was published in 2007. Um, so it is with great pleasure um, that I give uh, the word to, to Rosalind for her talk. And for those of you who are watching this online after the event, I should mention that because of some technical difficulties, unfortunately, a few minutes of Rosalind's presentations uh, did not make it onto the recording. Um, Rosalind uh, divided her presentation into three main points, uh, Tutankhamun's wardrobe, Tutankhamun's tunics and Tutankhamun's uh, underwear. And unfortunately, the first uh, few minutes of the first part of the talk uh, on Tutankhamun's wardrobe uh, is missing. Um, and we do apologize for that. But now, enjoy the talk. Um, so here we are in the tomb itself. Now, as you probably know, um, Tutankhamun's body is still in situ in his tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, look here at this relief that shows us um, his successor dressed in a leopard skin garment, performing what we call the opening of the mouth ceremony on the dead um, Tutankhamun. Um, so there are um, real leopard skin garments in the tomb and one imitation garment. And it was possible to reconstruct these. And Tutankhamun would certainly have worn these as ceremonial garments. And that is the image taken at the time by Harry Burton, the American photographer who was seconded to the expedition on the left. And you can see um, the very um, disintegrated leopard skin garment with these rosettes, the five pointed stars in gold, which were saved. And on the right, a wooden um, head of a leopard, which was attached to the imitation leopard garment. Um, which has been gilded and it has inlays of, for example, lapis lazuli. So extremely ornate and beautiful. Kerchiefs. Now these were worn around the head by ordinary people when they were engaged in act agricultural activities like winnowing, etc. And Tutankhamun has his own kerchief. So it makes the point that Tutankhamun actually would not have dressed so dissimilarly from the mass of the Egyptians. It's just that the linen would have been more precious, um, more better quality, and sometimes it would have been dyed. So you can see down at the bottom, um, we've got this blue um, kerchief. Dying is very rare in ancient Egypt because basically there was, um, the mordant was difficult to obtain. You had to obtain it from the Western desert to produce fast colors. So it was not a popular technique. So you simply tied these kerchiefs around the head, protection from the sun and from um, 
as I've told you, agriculture for the non-elite. And these are beautiful linen, as you can see, good quality. And also the hemming is very perfect and intricate. <clears throat> this is the um, kerchief, one of the, well, it was said to be a kerchief, but we now know it was actually part of a king's jacket, which was worn in a battle situation. And one of the tomb robbers had dropped this on the floor of the tomb. And you can clearly see that that uh, robber was trying to take away the gold rings and had used the um, material to wrap up the rings. He was surprised, no doubt, by the guards of the necropolis and had dropped that item. So here it is as found in situ. Um, gloves, I've already mentioned gloves. Um, these are in a technique called tapestry weaving, which was introduced to Egypt um, around just before, um, well, in the dynasty of Tutankhamun in about 1750 BCE. Um, and it's a technique that required a vertical loom, whereas before in Egypt, there was the horizontal ground loom, which would not have allowed for tapestry weaving. So you can create elaborate patterning with this technique. And here are the gloves as conserved um, in the new Egyptian G Grand Museum in Giza. Um, and there are rumors that it may um, be due to open to mark the anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in November this year, possibly. Um, now, this is what we look at when we go into the boxes as seen in the original photographs. Um, Carter lists over a hundred bundles, rolls, pads of cloth, often still unwrapped because they are, as I've told you, extremely delicate because they were damp. They were roughly repacked in the boxes when Tutankhamun died and this deterioration progressing since after 1922. Uh, the sandals, let's quickly look at the sandals. Um, so Carter recorded 93 items of footwear. These are fiber, but would come into the category of textiles. And we've got some beautiful examples of beaded um, sandals. And this nice quote from Arthur Mace, who was one of um, uh, Carter's assistants, that the beads literally drop off if you look at the shoes. So here we have examples of beaded sandals. Um, the motifs are the lotus flower um, at the top of the shoe. Uh, you can also see yellow mandrakes, which were used in banquets as the narcotic. You've got hieroglyphic motifs. And often on the sole, you would have bound prisoners, a European, uh, an Asiatic, and also perhaps um, a Nubian from the Sudan. And the idea was that as the king walked, he would literally be standing on his enemies. So it's all very, very strategically worked. We are now going to concentrate on a couple of these famous um, tunics. And the one I want to introduce you to first of all is what I called the christening gown of Tutankhamun. Um, I obviously know that they didn't have christenings, um, but potentially they had a naming ceremony of a young um, king or a young baby who was due to perhaps inherit the kingship. Um, this is one of the garments that actually covers that jackal shrine. So over the shrine, we have the shirt. We also have a scarf, which was tied around the jackal's neck. And we have a shawl as well. So literally three garments cover that jackal. And those garments are um, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, where I saw them quite recently and very, very fragile. 
um, really um, the shawl and the um, scarf are as fine as muslin. The, the linen is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, and we are now going to home into this so-called christening gown. Um, very simple, one piece of linen, it's got a fringe and, um, and you just fold it over, um, you cut out the neckline and it's got a rolled hem to it. Um, but it has been estimated um, that it would have taken about 3,000 hours um, to weave it. Um, and even if they were working 11 hours a day, that's nine months of work. So it is a very, very finely spun and evenly woven garment, which was originally bleached a pure white. It's got a neck opening fit for the head of a newborn baby, but in size, it's actually of adult proportions. And part of the garment at the bottom um, lower right, was an inscription, or isn't there? Is an inscription which has the name of Tutan, uh, the name of Akhenaten, the predecessor, probably Tutankhamun's father, and a date in year seven of his reign. And this is really important because it obviously affects chronology. So it's potentially the year that um, Tutankhamun was born. So these um, dockets, these graffiti, which were left on garments can be very, very important for our working out of Egyptian chronology. And that portion of the garment was cut off with modern scissors in the Cairo Museum and left in Cairo. So the importance was obviously then all on inscriptions and not on textiles. So this is a summary of the, the textile, the, the dress um, made about the time of Tutankhamun's birth, affecting the chronology with Akhenaten. Very, very fine, 3000 hours to weave it and probably used for a naming ceremony of the young king. Here we have his blue garment. This is a reconstruction by um, Julian Vogelsang Eastwood. Um, very dramatic with red rosettes to it. And when worn with the red crown of Lower Egypt, it would have looked very dramatic. And we also call it the, the falcon robe. This is because this is the front of it, and you can see that it's also got panels um, at the top, um, which have the name of Tutankhamun and rosettes at the bottom of it. But if we look at the back of it, um, it literally has the wings of the falcon. So when Tutankhamun put it on, he would literally become the living god Horus in contrast to the dead king who had become the um, mythical Osiris. So Horus is the, one of the sons of Osiris and is synonymous with the living king. So it's incredibly symbolic, this type of garment. This is the yellow tunic, now much um, faded, but what's really nice is you've got rows of ducks. So I just give you a detail of one of these nice looking ducks. And this is what is called the tunic of Tutankhamun, which you will be interested in as a sort of ritual garment because Tutankhamun actually, um, Carter actually said that it was used as a sort of ecclesiastical garment. So he used that um, term. It has separate sleeves to it, which you see on the um, original black and white image of it. And then you're seeing Gillian's reconstruction of it. Um, and you can also notice that it has the neck opening in the shape of the sign of life, the Egyptian Ankh sign. So when the Pharaoh put it on, he again was the living reincarnation of the god Horus. 
And all around the bottom of it, it has panels alternating light on dark and dark on light, um, which were embroidered. And embroidery is very rare in ancient Egypt and was probably um, introduced in Syria. So Syrians coming into Egypt to teach the Egyptians the art of embroidery, which was then um, used mostly for royal garments. So this is a, a fascinating piece. And it was found with gloves as well. So I think this is why um, Carter was seeing some sort of ecclesiastical function for it. We're now turning to our last section. Let me just check the time. Yes, his underwear. Um, so I'm showing you here another um, burial, more or less contemporary. And um, this is an architect who had 50 such items of underwear in his tomb. So this triangular loincloth basically works as um, like a nappy. You tie it around the waist and you pull in the triangular bit between the legs. And each one here in this tomb were marked with a laundry mark. So there was a professional laundry service in ancient Egypt and you needed to ensure that you got the right items back from the laundry. So this is what a triangular loincloth looks like. Tutankhamun's were very similar. Um, this is the luxury type of underwear. So it was cut on the bias. You see that you've got a um, depression at the top. Um, whereas the ones for the masses were just made as a um, um, straight um, cut off, um, which would not be nearly as comfortable. And the, the marks are either in ink or exceptionally they can be embroidered. So these are all ink marks. So the question I want to leave with you is, after all I've told you, how realistic is the king's clothing? This is an American production of 2015 called Tut. And you can see um, the king wearing a head cloth, um, this blue garment, lots of jewelry does it actually tie up to the reality? So maybe that can be our starting point for the discussion. Um, as a conclusion, Howard Carter wrote in 1923 in that famous article in embroidery where he said he didn't know about embroidery. This is what he said, the material from this tomb will be of supreme importance to the history of textile art and it needs careful study. Um, but the problem is that um, many, many questions remain unanswered, just as they did for Carter, and regrettably now will perhaps never need now be solved because of the deterioration of the garments. So the, the door of the royal wardrobe is really only slightly ajar and the unpacking, unfortunately, has not reached its fruition by any means. So I don't want to end on a negative note because that's really bad to do, um, but I hope I've um, managed to show you the um, spectacular nature of this, these garments and how much can be reconstructed and how we can learn about Tutankhamun daily dress, which is what I'm interested in, and right down to the underwear that he wore. So thank you very much. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you'll join me in thanking Rosalind for this fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. We can, there we can, there's both the, the real applause and the Zoom applause that we can use here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so there are a few more people in here than I can see just in one Zoom gallery. So um, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please uh, write to me in the chat uh, and I'll make a speaker's list. Um, but uh, maybe just to get us started, Rosalind, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, the thing about uh, Tutankhamun being uh, pear-shaped. Yes. Um... 
Yes, I, I realise I've just got that. I should have gone into it a bit more. Um, so these are the dimensions that um, Gillian gives for him. And these are literally based on the underwear um, that we've seen. Um, so his chest was um, 31 um, inches. I'm sorry if I haven't got the metric, just to be very annoying, but it will be hard That's fine. for Americans. Um, and the waist is 29 inches, but the hips are enormous. So his hips were 43 inches. Um, and this would hardly be surprising if, um, if so it's all very much um, conjecture. We can't be absolutely certain in any of this, and I'm not going to be. If his father Akhenaten, as based on the monuments, had a similar figure. Um, so this is what Gillian deduced based on the underwear. Right. Thank you. And then just so sorry I missed that, but I did get in in the thirty minutes. So yes, you did. <laughs> Very I well did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, please uh, go ahead if anyone has questions or, or comments. Oh, I have a uh, question here from Emily Teeter. Emily, would you like to ask it yourself? Yes, um, uh, Roz, thank you very much. Very, very Hello, interesting. Hello, Emily. Great. Very nice that you're here. Nice to see you. Um, can you, uh, not make you speak for somebody else, but I'm a little confused about these dimensions you just mentioned from Vogelsang Eastwood, who does such wonderful work. But mm. how did she determine those dimensions? And what pieces of what garments? Uh, so it was based on the triangular loincloth and a comparison with those um, that, um, from the tomb of Ka, which are obviously in Turin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then I have another question from Tres Henry. Uh, Henry, would, or Tres, sorry, would you like to, uh, to ask the question yourself as well? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, I'm just curious if we know what material the uh, the beads on the what Carter called the shoes or the sandals. It looked like very fine beadwork. Do we know what material those beads were made out of? Were they glass or what? Oh, they're faience, which is the um, it's a glaze over a pottery core, which is used. Um, throughout ancient Egypt for jewelry, etc. So they are faience beads in um, different colors, mainly blue, but also black, etc. Um, so they would be used for that beaded dress as well. Um, I suspect that they were actually using children uh, a lot in the textile industry for jobs such as um, beading. Um, and also for sewing. So I didn't really talk about the sewing, but um, the, the rolled hems and the whipping stitches are just so um, beautifully done. I mean, it implies um, good eyesight. Um, and when we had the bead net dress in the Petrie Museum reconstructed, it was um, extremely difficult to do it. And it was a case of using wire um, needles because no modern needle would be able to cope with the small size of the holes in the beads. So faience is the answer. Thank you. Thanks. And then uh, there's a question from Ulf von Rauchhaft. Ulf, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, uh, had there been any headgear found, especially the Nemes uh, um, headcloths, the famous one? Um, I was wondering. I've never seen any. Anything no, like that. no, not at all. So the the headgear was confined to the kerchiefs, which mm -hmm. I've shown you, um, and certainly no evidence of um, crowns mm -hmm. um, at all. Um, so, I mean, it's possible that we've got the use of basketry perhaps for crowns. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that they were ceremonially 
actually destroyed when the um, king died. Who knows? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but no, and certainly not in Tutankhamun's tomb. No. And also no Nemus. Um, no. Uh, no. Okay, no. interesting. Uh, only the, you know, that the blue one I showed you, but that's dyed mm -hmm. all over. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. But it's not to say, you know, that it, it isn't one of these totally blackened pieces mm -hmm. that are okay. irretrievable. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody has actually explored these textiles since Gillian did her work. And obviously that's um, some time ago now. Mm -hmm. So it's likely, um, but I have to say that the, the work that's being done in the um, new museum at, at Giza looks absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, and all the Tutankhamun objects, artifacts are going to be on display. So all 5,000 artifacts will be on public display, including the textiles. Great, thanks. Uh, which, which is what we hear, yeah. Thank you. And then I have a comment from uh, Stephanie Harris, I think about experimental archeology. span uh, Stephanie, please go ahead. Stephanie? Mm, we might not have audio for I'm Stephanie. Trying to unmute you. Ah, wonderful okay. week. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you so much. I'm proud to say I actually have your book in my collection. Oh, good. <laughs> um, were any kilts found amongst the garments? Yes. Um, um, because there is a... having, having looked, having been a sort of walked around Egyptian monuments and tombs and, and looked at sculpture, the style seemed to have gone through fashion changes through dynastic times. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those are strategic um, time. Has, um, yes, has there anyone was... done any? Sorry, we we're not sinking here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> has anyone done any, any experimental archaeology on recreating the types of folding? that seems to have happened in, in the kilts. I know there's been some work done on um, determining how pleating of linen dresses was done. Um, but I think folding kilts to me looks very similar to folding an Indian woman's sari. Um, and I just wondered if, if anyone's done any work from that point of view. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Very good question and um, right after my heart because I'm really a promoter of experimental Egyptology um, with the highlight being the making of a contraceptive, but that's another story. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I in fact did the pleating experiments um, and you, you can actually find that online. Um, so the University of Swansea um, and they put yes. all the conference online, so every yes. paper. Um, yeah. um, I've got that book. <laughs> um, yes, but you can actually see the um, conference in action yes. um, with everybody's presentation. Um, the kilts, um, there was the beaded kilt in Tutankhamun's tomb, and that's one example of where Carter um, kept the beads and had to sacrifice the linen. Um, actually, quite recently, I had um, a student um, in Australia. So I was teaching a course for Oxford Online um, and her project was um, pleating. Um, it wasn't um, totally the right time of year for her to be doing it because it was winter in Australia at the time and she couldn't, you know, couldn't have access to the sun. Um, but um, so she made um, attempts to um, replicate kilts, but I don't know anything that's been published, although Gillian has written um, a book called Patterned um, Textiles, mm. um, which was um, 
published some years ago. Um, and if you can get hold of that, that would be very useful. Or her book on Therionic Egyptian clothing, that's the more expensive book, um, would be um, a possibility for talking about changes over time and techniques. Mm -hmm. But the replication, um, I'm not really aware of apart from this student of okay. mine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and then I have a Gail uh, Rothschild. Uh, please go ahead, Gail. Just see if we can get audio for Gail. Hey, hey, guys. Hi, there you are. Hi. Um, Rosalind, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering, and I may write you independently and show you why I'm so interested in ancient underwear. Um, I'm an artist who's done a number of paintings of ancient underwear. Um, are there any images that you have of the Tutankhamun loincloths? Because the images that you showed, I think, were all of Haz. Um, I do potentially. I'd have to dig it out, but okay. um, yes, I think I think I do. Yes, um, right. it's just that right. he's the better for showing laundry marks, and that's what yep. I want yep. to bring over. Yes, I think I do. I'd be very interested to see those. Yeah. And, I, and I can check Julian's book because I do have it. Yes. So you, you need to email me separately, and if anybody does want to um, contact me after. The, the talk, my email, so I'm going to give it to you, is literally R, full stop, and then the surname, make sure you put the two S's, um, at ucl.ac.uk. Got it. Oh, sorry, I can share it in the chat as well. Yeah, that as might well. be. <laughs> yeah, lovely. <laughs> Um, there you go. Okay, thank you. And um, I had the pleasure of of, um, of meeting uh, um, Gail online last week for the first time, and I've seen some of her artwork, and it's yeah. really brilliant. So anyone who likes textiles will love to see Gail's work mm -hmm. as well. So do do check that out. And and you got your reply, right, Gail? Yes, I did. Excellent. If you care to put my website in the chat, it's just my of name. Of course, I'll do that immediately. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay, because then I have a question from Constance uh, Magowski uh, about embroidery. Please yes, go ahead, Constance. You. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. It was wonderful. Does any of the embroidery have designs or motifs that can be identified? I have not seen any photographs of them close up enough to see if they could perhaps relate to Western Asiatic stylistic traditions, if indeed the embroiderers were Syrian people? It would be yeah, interesting I, to I, know. Ab absolutely. I didn't have um, time to go into that, Constance. And what a lovely backdrop you've got of the West Bank. Um, yes, um, these panels are um, a juxtaposition of Egyptian and um, Asiatic motifs. Um, so for example, you've got um, animals, um, which um, can be, you know, place between one of the two locations. You've got winged um, griffins, um, you've got palmettes. Um, so it's definitely Mesopotamian Egyptian motifs um, combined in these panels. Um, an article was published by Winifred Brunton on the panels long time ago. Um, just after the Second World War, about 45 or so, um, in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. So that, that's the article that you need. If you can't find it, email me. Um, Great, and thank you. And we've got black and white pictures of the panels as well. Thank you. Thanks. And then we just got a recommendation in the chat as well um, for a forthcoming book, it's Emily uh, who recommends a forthcoming book by Alexandra Holman 
on late period clothing. Oh, uh, right. okay. Uh, and it's supposed to include kilts and their wrapping and folding. It should be out later this year okay. in 2022. May I say a word? Yes, um, please. That the book draws very highly on Roz's work and also on uh, Fogelsang Eastwood. And it's going to be a very important book. A another thing about embroidery is there an experimental archaeology. There is a, an American woman named Nancy Hoskins who yes. has been who has been reproducing some of the tapestry and the weaving, and it's absolutely yeah. fascinating. And again, with all this this um, experimental archaeology, it gives you an appreciation of how difficult these techniques were and how clever the Egyptians were. Yeah. But uh, both of those, Alexander Hallman, when it comes out, and, and uh, Nancy Haskins, Haskins, excuse me, H O S K I N S, mm -hmm. a lot of her material, I think, is online. But That's both right. very heavily on Roz's work. And it, it's lovely to know, you know, that some um, younger scholars are following the work that Gillian and I Yes. Do. And and of course Gillian is still very, very much involved running her um workshops in Leiden. Um so I'd encourage any of you who wants to do one of those to check them out. So they go over several days um, and are also in English or Dutch, depending on what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I've put myself on the list as well because I was, um, I was just curious. You mentioned that some of, of the clothes had shown what they were showing signs of, of having been worn, or at least the, the children's garments had showed signs of being one mm -hmm. but what was sort of if you try to look at the the textiles as a as a collection were there more garments that shown showed signs of having been worn than the opposite or were they mostly newly produced is it even possible to make an estimate uh not really because those state robes may have just been worn once and certainly the so-called christening gown would have just been you know one off um, but there are definite signs on those children's garments. Um, you know, perspiration, et cetera, is normally a sign, um, as is in other tombs, inside out um, garments. Um, I don't think we, we could get that close to making an estimation, but it is, you know, where garments having been worn is obviously very, very, um, strategic um, and fascinating. Um, so we have, for example, socks in the Petrie Museum, which were inside out. And obviously it's extremely important that when one does the, the conservation to preserve the archeological evidence. And really one of my greatest um, regrets as it were, is the, the Tarkhan dress in the Petrie, which started me off with, on textiles that um, we um, turned it, not me personally, but the conservator. Um, and, um, you know, really it should have been, remained inside out, but at the time it's just a product of the, the, the time we were doing it and we wouldn't do it now, we've moved on. Yeah. Uh, but with the, the jackal um, scarf, um, certainly in the conservation, they have preserved the tie around the, the jackal's neck. So it has not been flattened. It is still there and you can see how it, it was tied. Mm. Right, thank you. And if I may so just one- by the jackal anyway, so sorry, that's a <laughs> bit of a roundabout way, but I, I don't think I can answer your question. No, no, that's, I understand. Yeah. And I was also thinking, you mentioned how with the kerchiefs that, that the, um, the sort of the dress style of Tutankhamun was not all that different from what we think more normal uh, or common Egyptians were yes. born. So if you compare his wardrobe to what we know from mostly iconography, is there also a, a pretty good overlap of, of the actual textiles that you have in the tomb and the, the clothing that you see on reliefs and statues? Um, the problem with reliefs and statues um, is that they are very much idealized. 
Um, they don't show us the, the drapery because of the conventions of the Egyptian art. Um, so it's difficult to get an idea, a detailed idea of tailoring, et cetera. Um, and also they tend to be conservative in nature. So often they're showing us um, fashions which are not contemporary. So that's right. a, um, a difficulty. Um, what I should perhaps have said about those um, archers gauntlets is that um, the latest evidence which moves on every few years is that Tutankhamun is considered to, well, we can't deny it, to have had um, a problem with his um, left foot, a sort of necrosis of the metatarsal. Um, and um, so this probably implies that um, he had the upper body strength. So archery is likely to have been his sporting activity because obviously you, you can do that. Um, seated if necessary. Um, so there is definite evidence that he was um, a trained archer from a young right. age. So fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I have another question from Teddy Papas. Teddy, please go ahead. No. Oh, we just need you to unmute, please. Sorry about that. Um, I am working on a book on the Shroud of Turin, and one of the issues is linen and ancient linen and um, what sort of stain, whether bodily stains could have caused the yellowing. I personally don't think that's an issue with the shroud, but that's something that skeptics bring up. And so when you were talking about um, stains that stains have been noticed on uh, Tutankhamun's linens uh, that implies that there is something where there's evidence that can be you know determined that that stains have survived the test of time like that is it yellowing has there been any um, chemical analyses of, of, of you know perspiration stains, other bodily stains. I, I, there's, I just don't know if they've been oxidized over the years, things like that. So, I, I mean, I know this is kind of beyond the scope, but given- No, the it's a fascinating question, um, Teddy, really fascinating. Um, all I really know is that the time of the conservation of the Tarkon dress in the Petri, which was back in 79, um, the conservator clearly identified um, perspiration staining. Um, so it would be a case of looking at her original report. Now we, we published that in um, studies in conservation, literally back in 1979. So you could check that out and see if she wrote her bit on um, any analysis of the perspiration staining. And who, um, what is the name uh, again? Sheila Landy, L-A-N-D-I, from the DNA. Um, so that would be a good place to start. It would actually be very worth your while checking um, Turin, the mm -hmm. Egyptian Museum in Turin, because they have um, a number of um, pleated Egyptian dresses which have recently um, emerged um, and they publish them and see what um, conservation um, took place. So um, the director is Christian Greco of the um, Egyptian Museum Turin, especially as you're working Latin. on Can the you Turin. Greco, G-R-E-C-O. Okay. Greco. G -R -E -C -O, okay. Dr. Greco. Um, but you're doing fascinating work yourself. I, I was really pleased when I was in Turin looking at the Egyptian dress there. Um, oh, wonderful. I saw the shroud. It was one of the years it was open. Wonderful. I think it's every, is it every 25 years or something? Oh, it's random. And a lot right. of times it can be very, very long stretches okay. before it's, um, it's on exhibition. So yeah. uh, you're very fortunate to see it. Yes, I think I was. 
Well, I'm, I've, it, this has been a great talk because I've also been very fascinated with uh, anything Egyptian. So uh, I've, I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you for your talk. Right. Um, and the, the talk on dress in the Petri has recently been radiocarbon dated again. Um, so, um, you know, it might be worth checking if anything was done on the perspiration staining. Okay, will do. Thank you. Very helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, and Stephanie, you have a question about wool, I believe. Please go ahead. Sorry, um, I just wanted to find out were any, were there any woolen garments found amongst Tutankhamun's cash? You, you mentioned no. linen. No, not wool. Um, At all. We, no, we, no we, but we now many... know that wool was much more frequently used in Egyptian burials, and it's a sort of misreading of Herodotus who says that it wasn't um, considered appropriate to have wool in, in tombs. That, that's actually not correct. Um, no, not as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. Egyptian winter nights get really chilly, having it, been exactly. in winter myself. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. And, and they certainly would have needed um, wooden garments, definitely wooden shawls, et cetera. Um, but, but not identified in the. Not identified. the yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking as part of a trade, trade exchange, trade route, possibly from further north. Uh, well, Rome, I mean, Mesopotamia. Egypt had, um, no, they wouldn't need to go outside because the um, the sheep, the breed of sheep from the, the New Kingdom is a very suitable breed for wool. And okay. at settlement sites such as um, Amarna, for example, there, there is um, a, a lot of evidence of woolen garments. And it, again, Gillian was involved in the... Um, Amana project as the textile expert. Um, so wool and goat hair is um, found at Amana. So on modern excavations of settlement sites, wool is appearing all, all the time and certainly from the New Kingdom. It's the Middle Kingdom breed that didn't produce good wool. But in the New Kingdom, it was a new type of sheep which did. So it's you know native as it wants in Egypt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let's see, um, Simona um, Kotva, please go ahead. Hello, thank you so much. That was really really interesting. Um, I if it's not too off topic. Um, and th I'd love to hear more about what you mentioned about the experimental archaeology involved in reconstructing ancient Egyptian prophylactics, if I heard you correctly. Uh, yes, um, Simone. Um, so um, it was an experiment um, to um, reproduce an Egyptian contraceptive um, as um, based on one of the prescriptions in the Cahoon papyri. So a fairly simple um, prescription that one could use um, equivalent ingredients. Um, and I started off by um, doing this sort of training day at the City Lit and the staff really didn't want to be trained in anything because they'd just come back from their holidays and they had a lot of work to do. Um, but they had to sort of go around to all these um, courses. Um, and mine was um, literally for them to work in pairs and grind down um, certain ingredients such as honey, for example, dates, um, etc., carob seeds. 
um, and produce some kind of concoction and then put it in a lint bag and tie it with a little bit of string. Um, but it was great fun doing it. And obviously it's the evaluation afterwards, you know, tying it up with the um, uh, textual evidence and how would it have been used, etc. And it's obviously good, very um, successful from the, the learning point of view, because if you've sort of done it, you never forget um, how you did this bizarre course, sort of making a contraceptive. So I did write it up um, for the um, for Rosalie David. Um, so she was presented with a, a volume on her 70th birthday. And I wrote this chapter on experimental um, Egyptology. Um, so that whole experiment is there. So that's one particular example, but every opportunity I would try and do that sort of um, technique. So I did actually a whole course at Oxford um, and each week we made something different. So we drew on ostrich hair. Um, we made soul houses actually. So um, which was um, in conjunction with a, a potter, a local potter, um, and based on actual objects in the Ashmolean Museum. Um, so I've, I've done quite a bit of this, and I've, I've also published it in um, volumes on. Um, teaching and learning in higher education, so out of Egyptology. So if you want to contact me, I can give you the references. Thank you so much. So it fits into two fields, Egyptology, but also um, teaching and learning. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes left in case someone has another question or, or comment they would like to ask before we end. I actually have one more question, if I may. Yeah, sure. You mentioned the, the professional laundry service of ancient Egypt, and I, I also found that quite fascinating with the laundry marks. Um, is how were they, the laundry services, would they cater to everyone or would you rather have something like a palace laundry service? It, or do we even know? Is it possible to? Uh Yes, we, we do know, um, but most of our evidence is from the, the village of Dera Medina on the West Bank at Luxor. And I hear, I see that Lenka Peacock is here and she has a, a wonderful website that you can check out on Dera Medina. Um, and that village was the home, as it were, of the artisans who built the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings, Queens. Um, and um, because they left written records and there was approximately 40% literacy rate in the village and because it's a desert community, the um, text has survived. Um, so we can piece together the laundry service. Um, it was entirely staffed by men. You do not get professional um, laundry women as it were until the Greco-Roman period. Um, we know a lot about the um, rights of the laundry men. They were even um, able to go on strike um, because they weren't um, given enough soap. Um, and they um, had to serve more houses than they should have done. So strikes are not new. And here we're having strikes all the time. If, trains and today the post office has gone on strike. So what is new? So these laundry men in ancient Egypt were striking, um, overworked, underpaid, not enough detergent. Um, so it, it's fascinating. We know the names of laundry men. We know that sometimes the women had to deliver the laundry so the men didn't even come and collect it. Um, we've got lists of what they wash so we can tell what the most frequently washed garment is. And we do know that they wash their underwear more frequently than their outer garments. So it's amazing, you know, what we can piece together from it. Um, so it's, yeah, really ab absolutely incredible. So from that, that village, we can reconstruct 
the laundry service for a middle class, let's say, in inverted commas, um, population. But obviously, the, the mass of the population would be having to do their own laundry, may, maybe teaming up with other households. Mm. Um, and I did write um, an article on the laundry service with, with my husband um, some years ago. So, um, yeah, which was fascinating. Right. Thank so you. that's the minutiae of ancient Egypt. Um, Gillian also published um, some texts where you've got um, drawings of garments on pot shirts, and it seems to be that these are illiterate, perhaps laundry men who couldn't, you know, write um, script. So they were putting the drawings of what they washed, and it's fascinating trying to identify what those garments are. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is incredible to have that kind of material. Yeah. I have one final question, and then I think time is uh, is running out. But uh, Teddy, please go ahead. Oh yes, um, I was just curious if there are any um, close-up shots of the linen, like photo micrographs, perhaps it like a ninety times magnification or less to where you're not getting too tight of a shot of the linen. Um, I'm looking, I'm, I'm curious to see about mold spores or little black dots. I've detected both on the Shroud of Turin and on other pieces of ancient linen, um, just one other piece, but uh, sometimes these little black spots. And I'm curious if these, if it's mold, if it's iron from the redding process or dirt or debris from the redding process. And so I didn't know if y'all had some, uh, you know, really close up shots of all this beautiful linen. Um, I don't know of any from the, the Tutankhamun wardrobe. It will be worth contacting um, Gillian, but she, obviously she was doing her work some time ago. So I think you need to, con to um, look at modern um, conservation of um, materials. And again, I think I would direct you to the Turin Museum um, okay. as a, a starting okay. point, um, All right. because I know that they have recently found those garments and conserved them. Um, does that help? Yes, absolutely. Yes. The, the people that you've told yep. me to contact. Yeah, because conservatives would, would have to take that sort of um, right. image. Definitely. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, um, Rosalind, for sharing this incredible material with us and also your vast knowledge of, uh, of textiles in ancient Egypt. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to listen to you. So thank you so much. And My see... pleasure. And it's lovely to see so many names of people that I know and haven't met for a long, long time. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. And before I let you all get away and, um, and um, have a lovely weekend, um, I would like to uh, just mention that in three weeks on Friday, um, 16th of September at 3 p.m. Uh, we have uh, the next lecture in the Ancient Attire series. It's Dr. Laura Quick, uh, and she's going to talk about divine dress divinization and dethronement in the Hebrew Bible. And it's again 3 p.m. Oslo time. So please do join us uh, for that. And then I would like to thank you all for, um, for coming. And then please uh, join me in thanking Rosalind uh, again for her uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you so much and thank you for now.